we are immensely grateful. Jack. Welcome. It's a pleasure uh, to be here this afternoon uh, with so many friends, uh, colleagues, and uh, partners uh, on an issue that's of critical importance to all of us uh, in the nation and the world, global health. I want to thank uh, Helene for that uh, generous introduction and for her leadership, her work uh, at the CDC, the Gates Foundation and CARE, as co-chair of this commission. She's played an integral role in shaping our nation's approach uh, to improving health care here at home and around the world. I also want to thank Admiral Fallon. Uh, after a distinguished military career, he has turned his attention to the very real national and global security threats posed by the inadequate health systems of the world. Uh, the world is coming to realize uh, something that Admiral Fallon figured out a long time ago, that when people's lives and livelihoods are at risk, their communities are not secure, and that insecurity can spread across borders and oceans and affect all of us. I also want to thank uh, everyone who served uh, here at CIS, CSIS uh, on the Commission on Smart Global Health po Policy. Uh, the Commission represents uh, a broad range of expertise and viewpoints, including uh, my good friend Donna Shalala and my friend Bob Rubin, Senator Bill Frist, who recently returned himself from doing heroic work caring for victims of the earthquake in Haiti, and to the outstanding team here at CSIS, uh, John Hamry, Lisa Carty, Steve Morrison. As a group, uh, these commissioners remind us that saving lives and preventing disease are shared goals that transcend political differences and draw on the deepest of American values. This report reflects their broad knowledge, experience, and dedication. It's full of innovative thinking and persuasive arguments for how our country can get better results from our work to improve health work worldwide. And I join you in looking forward to seeing these ideas take root in policies and programs. I also bring the congratulations of the Secretary of State who is in Moscow today representing the United States at a meeting with Russia, the EU, and the UN, and making progress, we hope, on resolving uh, the Middle East conflict. Uh, she sends her thanks to all of you for the work you are doing here to foster uh, peace through health. Let me begin today by asking you to imagine two women who live not far from each other uh, on the other side of the world. Both have just given birth. Like most women worldwide, they did not deliver their babies in a hospital, but at home with the help of family members and perhaps a midwife. And they both experienced a not uncommon consequence of childbirth, postpartum hemorrhage. The first woman lives in a village with a small health clinic that has a trained nurse and is stocked with oxytocin, an inexpensive drug that can stop the bleeding. The second woman does not. The first woman lives. The second woman dies and the ch her children lose their mother and their provider. It's clear how the absence of a simple intervention devastated this one woman's family. What may be less clear is why her life and her family's health matters to us. That's what I'd like to discuss today, how the health of people on the other side of the planet affect the lives of people everywhere, including the United States, and how, as a result, the Obama administration is working to improve global health in a new way with a new commitment. When people think of global health threats, they often think of pandemics. And it is true that the diseases in one country can quickly spread to another, which we saw earlier at the end of last year with H1N1, which swept the globe in a matter of weeks. But the impact of poor health care goes beyond the spread of disease. Poor health prolongs poverty. When people are sick, injured, or underfed, their ability to work or attend school declines. Health crises foster political instability as we've seen in countries ravaged by AIDS, when millions of adults disappear and states shut down or fall apart. Disease fuels famine when farmers grow too sick to work, their crops die, and widespread hunger can result, and that sparks violence. There have been food riots in more than 60 countries since 2007, because people who can't feed themselves or their children find themselves in situations where sometimes all they can do to express themselves is riot. And disease and undernutrition sustain the social and economic divides that prevent billions of people from participating in the life of their communities, contributing to broader progress, and pursuing their own dreams and aspirations. In other words, health crisis is more than a health crisis. It's a political crisis, an economic crisis, 
a social crisis, and a security crisis. And in our interconnected world, crises that start in other countries rarely stay there. But this is only half of the story. Just as poor health has a broad impact, promoting better health can have a broad impact. When health improves, economies grow, opportunities rise, trust in government increases, societies flourish, and life becomes more stable and secure. Furthermore, as the story of the two women illustrates, life-saving interventions are often inexpensive and easy to administer. A dose of nevirapine costs less than $5. A shot of the measles vaccine costs less than a quarter. And a dose of oral rehydration therapy costs about a dime. Yet every year, more than 400,000 babies are infected with HIV. About 3 million people die from vaccine-preventable diseases. And 1.5 million children die from diarrheal disease. For these reasons, a strong connection between health and broader progress and the potential for investments in health to have a significant impact across many lives, the Obama administration has made global health a central priority of U.S. foreign policy. We're investing in health to save lives and alleviate needless human suffering. We're also doing it as a means of protecting our citizens, supporting our partners, and making headway across a range of issues. Improving global health accords with both our values and our interests. It is an urgent national and global need that we cannot underestimate or overlook. Last May, as Gail and Admiral Fallon noticed, President Obama announced the launch of the Global Health Initiative, a $63 billion commitment over six years to improve health outcomes, with a particular focus on improving the health of women, newborns, and children. This initiative continues a strong tradition of U.S. support for global health. The United States is the world's leading contributor to the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. We're the largest donor country to the Gavi Alliance, and we've had great success in fighting AIDS through PEPFAR. Since President Bush launched PEPFAR in 2003, it has delivered life-saving antiretroviral medicine to more than 2.4 million people, provided care to nearly 11 million, and prevented almost 350,000 cases of mother-to-child transmission of the virus. And now PEPFAR will be a cornerstone of the Global Health Initiative. Our budget request for 2011 represents the largest commitment the United States has ever made towards fighting AIDS. So with the Global Health Initiative, we're building on years of experience and commitment, much of it done with the support of many here today. But this initiative is not simply a continuation of past practices. It represents a new business model, one that emphasizes integration and coordination across the health spectrum, rather than addressing single diseases in isolation one that leverages our existing investments for broader impact, and one that is built upon the principle of partnership so that the countries we work with can, in time, provide care to their own citizens without relying on us or other donor countries to fill critical gaps. We are reaffirming our commitment to the core services that have saved countless lives and served as the hallmark of global health, our global health efforts. The United States will continue to deliver drugs and vaccines and bed nets and birthing kits to people worldwide. But we all know this model of aid cannot be sustained indefinitely. That's why we're working to make our health programs, take our health programs to the next level by helping our partners expand and strengthen their own systems. For example, by establishing better supply chains so local clinics have enough frontline drugs and basic supplies to serve their communities. And by building on existing clinics so a woman gains access to HIV counseling, prenatal care, delivery care, and family planning all at one location. We also hope to help countries provide not only treatment for those who are sick, but preventative care to protect people from getting sick in the first place. It may not be self-evident to place prevention as a top priority when the needs of the sick are so great, but that is when prevention is even more critical, to stop the spread of illness and lessen a given disease's long-term impact. For example, for every two people we put on AIDS treatment today, five more are infected, and we continue to lose ground against this and other epidemics. In many places today, local health workers are too overwhelmed by patients with urgent needs to focus on prevention and wellness. By expanding their capacity, we hope to change that. We are doing our work with an eye towards innovation. The United States has a strong tradition of funding, developing, and implementing health innovations. And that tradition must continue across the board. From the pursuit of new vaccines, to the use of new diagnostic technologies, to the development of innovative financing mechanisms. We're calling on our ambassadors to play a new coordinating role. As our chiefs of mission, they're best positioned to bring everyone together around one table and harmonize their efforts, not only in health, but in our work on climate change, 
food security, and so many other areas. And we are embracing a new commitment to results. Rather than measuring our success by how many programs we run or how many dollars we spend, we are investing in monitoring and evaluating our work so we can track our progress and learn from both our mistakes and best practices. There are a few specific health issues we are focusing on immediately, including nutrition, safe water, and neglected tropical diseases. But there's one area in particular that I'd like to address today, and that's maternal and child health. Because of the central role they play in caring for others, the health of women is critical to the health of children, families, and communities. When mothers are sick, their children suffer. When mothers die, their children are more likely to die. This has broad implications. In fact, one of the most constant predictors for political upheaval is the rate of infant mortality. Because in places where infant mortality is high, the quality of life is often low. Despite the importance of women's and children's health to larger progress, unfortunately, they're particularly vulnerable to poor health, in part because of entrenched attitudes about whether women and children, particularly girls, should receive care as a matter of high priority. As a result, childbirth continues to be one of the leading causes of death for women in low-income countries, and nearly 9 million children under the age of 5 die every year, mostly from preventable causes. This issue features prominently and persuasively in your report, and it is a priority that we share. Some of the changes to U.S. policy I've discussed today are already underway. Others will be implemented in the months ahead. Virtually all are addressed in this Commission's important work, which we're here to celebrate the launch of today. Together, they represent a new approach and new commitment to improving the health of people worldwide. This work won't be finished in a year, but the United States is invested in it for the long term. We are committed to seeing it through, and we are committed to tying our programmatic efforts with a renewed emphasis on global health diplomacy to raise health issues not only in the context of development, but also in the context of democracy and the security of nations and institutions worldwide. The people in this room represent our country's top talent in the field of global health. We are counting on each of you and the organizations and institutions that you represent to help. Your experience and dedication will make all the difference in our work worldwide. We need your ideas, we invite your critiques, and we ask for your support. The road ahead is sure to be full of obstacles. There will be times that we try something new and fail. We will grapple with tangled bureaucracies and struggle to maintain momentum. This will not be easy. Indeed, it's one of the most ambitious projects we've ever embarked upon. But we must always remember that the future we are working to achieve is the real goal. It's a future where parents line up outside clinics on vaccination day, and there are always enough shots for every child, where mothers receive competent and compassionate care as they bring new life into the world, where pharmacies are stocked with the, with the essentials so no one has to die for want of a simple cure, and where people everywhere have the chance to live safe, healthy, and productive lives, no matter where they live or what their income. This is the future we hope to achieve and the foundation of stability, prosperity, and peace for our country and for the world. Thank you. Thanks uh, so much for those comments. And, and again, we really want to, uh, on behalf of the commissioners, really thank you for the time that you and, and Dana and, and others on your staff have taken uh, as we've worked through this. Let me just throw out a couple of questions to begin with. You know, this is a town that does a lot of reports, a lot of report writing. Um, and, and clearly, as you said, you know, this area is something that the administration has already taken on and made a commitment. Tell us a little bit why a report like this is or is not helpful. Well, it is helpful, uh, hopefully. Uh, but uh, tell us uh, how, what, what a report like this does. And then, you know, maybe how should we think about the next stage of this, because we don't want this to just be a report that sits on a shelf. You know, how can this continue to be helpful to your work? Well, it's already more than just a report that sits on a shelf. When we had our first meeting, uh, better part of a year ago, um, we went over what our schedule was for putting together the Global Health Initiative. And um, in fact, we've already had the kinds of conversations where the work leading up to this report has helped us develop our thinking as we've developed the Global Health Initiative. Um, I think if you look at the content of the Global Health Initiative and the context of this report, there are a lot of um, similar uh, strains of thought and, and the, the basic direction of the, of the objectives. 
I think as we go forward, um, there's obviously a challenge uh, in the fiscal climate we're in uh, to maintain the, the sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the funding for the program will be critical to our being able to implement it. Um, the transition from focusing exclusively or primarily on disease treatment to the broader connection between different aspects of health programs challenges a way of doing business that was pretty well uh, established. Uh, we think it's critical. I think reading the report, the report thinks it's critical, and the debate continues. So uh, we need uh, both the members of the commission and those who agree with its results to remain engaged uh, in the public debate. Great. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the Department of State, of course, engages uh, with our uh, neighbors and uh, friends and uh, countries around the world. One of the observations that we as commissioners uh, uh, came uh, to realize pretty quickly was how essential it is for these partner countries to actually work with us. So uh, uh, it seems uh, we may have great ideas and, and hopefully we're, we'll have the funding to support this. Um, any ideas uh, or uh, thoughts about how we get uh, these other countries to really uh, be true partners with us in this effort? You know, I've had bilateral conversations with probably the better part of a dozen countries. Um, I've spoken to the leaders of most of the international health organizations, and I think we've made substantial progress in the last year. The issues that we're discussing have resonance uh, mm -hmm. in, in foreign capitals, in international organizations. Um, I think we're at a point where our following through on our piece of it is what we need to do to gain the, the credibility and have the leverage to take it to the next step. I think there's a growing appreciation um, uh, amongst donor countries that there's a need for ownership uh, in, the, in the countries that we're trying to help. Uh, you see it in the Paris and the Accra Accords. You see it in the principles that our president laid out uh, when he was in Laquila last year. Um, and it's very deeply embedded in our global health initiative and, and, and the direction of the report. Um, I think we also have to be sensitive to the fact that we're going into countries that almost by definition, because they're developing countries, don't have the very high level of, um, of resource to be dealing separately with uh, 20 or 30 or 40 of us who want to help. So we owe it to them to coordinate a little bit and make it easier for them. Uh, and I, I think that there is an interest uh, in, the, in the world community to do that. We're certainly, through the State Department and USAID, investing a lot in the effort of reaching out uh, on a diplomatic and, and a kind of development partner basis uh, to make that happen. You know, you, you've got a lot of things on, on your plate, and global health is one of those. And, you know, you, one of the things you're leading on is really looking at the overall picture of how we do our foreign assistance and, and you know, how we go about doing that perhaps in a way that's, you know, more integrated, more strategic, um, longer-term vision, et cetera. Say a little bit about how this uh, area of global health fits into the overall thinking. You touched on it a little bit in your comments, but as you look at the broad picture of, of our efforts in foreign assistance and foreign development, where does this fit? How does it integrate? And, and what are you, what's been your thinking about that as you go through some of the studies that are, going, that are ongoing now? Health um, starts out in a different place than other issues because we have a pre-existing set of programs that are so well established. So it's a great benefit in health that we have a rich resource base and the question is how can we use that resource base and the additions to it most effectively. Um, it, it, it's a little bit more complicated than some other areas because of that well established history. Uh, it, we're not starting with a clean slate, we're starting with programs that work well where we don't want to do any harm to the programs that are working well as we move forward. Um, I think that, that if you look at our kind of overall approach, uh, and the Secretary's speech uh, recently highlighted this, we're going to focus on doing the things that we do well and that we are really effective at in places where we can really make a difference. That's reflected in the principles of our Global Health Initiative because we're going to make that extra level of investment in the countries where we think we can really move the, the ball forward. Uh, it's in our food security initiative, that's a principle that we followed as well. Um, it, it's not something we can do unilaterally. We have to do it with the, the, the partners in the countries we're trying to help. Mm -hmm. They have to have a plan, they have to have ownership of it. 
Um, we have to tie together the, the programmatic spending in our diplomacy. Uh, it's not just a question of can we write checks to pay for programs, but can we work with heads of states, finance ministers, to build the support for programs like health security into their future budgets, into their own priorities. Uh, it's a diplomatic as well as a development challenge. Um, I think in some ways uh, it reflects what we're trying to do overall in our, in our uh, foreign assistance programs. Um, it's kind of outsized just because our commitment to health is so large, which creates, I think, as I said, special opportunities, but also unique challenges. Let me just follow that up with one and then I'll, uh, Bill to wrap up with the last question. Uh, you know, your background before was looking at budgets. This is uh, going to be a big ticket item. This is a tough time. Why are you optimistic that we will find the will to be able to provide the resources that are necessary to, to, to move this more broader agenda forward? I think we're in a very challenging fiscal environment. Uh, we're obviously at a moment where our national deficit and our national economy make uh, the kind of sustained commitments to uh, any program more challenging than they would have been in an environment that existed not that many years ago when we had a surplus and the ability to do things uh, with more ease. I think you have to ask why over the last few years with this growing sense of concern for fiscal discipline and an extremely um, uh, weak U.S. economy, why did we see increasing levels of support for foreign assistance? In the 13 months since we've been in office, we've seen several instances in, in the, in the the budget appropriation process of quite significant increases in spending uh, in this area. I think it reflects the, the, the challenges of the world we're in. Yeah. There's a profound sense that our security depends on our having the kind of uh, connection between the programs that we're supporting because they're the right things to do and the kind of world we need to live in to make it a safe world for our people. Um, I think those are not contradictory concepts. You can do something because you want to help people, but you can also be honest about the fact that by helping others, we make the world safer for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that has a lot to do with why we're seeing the kind of support. Mm -hmm. And I think that the clear focus on results has been mm -hmm. one of the hallmarks mm -hmm. of recent years. You know, the PEPFAR program has delivered on the promise to cover people in treatment programs. Mm -hmm. That's been enormously important. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to, in this initiative, have clear benchmarks of how many lives are we saving? How many mm -hmm. mothers are not dying in childbirth? How many children are not dying unnecessarily of, of diseases of infancy? I think if we can show results and show that it is tied to the security of the countries that we're helping, uh, I'm, I, I'm op an optimist. Great. We need optimists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jack, just one final uh, question. Uh, you know, around this town, uh, people get uh, diverted pretty quickly into the issues du jour and and certainly uh, health is, uh, is in uh, the limelight, but it's domestic health. Uh, we've uh, uh, articulated, and you've very, uh, very, very uh, convincingly uh, laid out these connections uh, between our future here in this country and uh, security and, and uh, tying in the health business. How, uh, how do you think we're going to be able to uh, keep uh, the political attention uh, on this issue, uh, keep enough attention on it to actually make progress while we're dealing with all these other uh, things that are uh, much closer to home? Well, I, I think in terms of the administration, you have a, a group of people who care passionately about this issue. So it's not going to take a lot to keep the administration focused on it. It starts out from the Secretary of State to the you know, Administrator of USAID all the way to the President of the United States. Um, the kind of commitment uh, to this issue that's strong and deep. I think you have, uh, from the last decade, a growing commitment in Congress to take global health issues seriously. Um, I also think, not unimportantly, and as somebody who left Washington nine years ago, came back a year, just a year ago, um, a different environment in terms of there being a, a community of interest that expresses its views in an effective way. Uh, ten years ago, you didn't have effective advocacy for these issues where it showed that it's not just an issue that a few doctors or a few health experts cared about, but it's something that went deep into the values of American communities and that resonates with our security values the way we're talking about today. I think we have to maintain that. I think it's very real, it's true, 
Um, but I, I, as somebody who had to defend uh, foreign assistance budgets 10 years ago and last year, mm -hmm. it's a different story when there's a perception that people outside of the room you're in care about it. And I just uh, I thank you for the work that all of you have done and for the many people in this room who've made that change happen. I think it's a meaningful difference. Okay. Well, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your very, very generous uh, commitment of time and effort and, and uh, great thoughts and ideas thank to you. join thank us you. here and, and our help. Thank thank you. You. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That was great. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Keep in touch. Okay, thanks. Thanks very thanks. much. We're going to move very rapidly to our next panel. I'd like to invite Mike Merson, uh, Donna Shalala, uh, Joe Rospers to come up and join Helene Gale for the panel on women and girls. Thank you. Yeah, that'll be good. Huh? Have the mics on? Okay. So this panel is on uh, delivering on a new commitment to mothers and girls. Uh, we're a little bit behind schedule already, and I had been asked to frame this, but I think it's been beautifully framed already um, by um, Helene, by uh, the Deputy Secretary. Clearly, the state of 